I mentioned I wanted to say a little bit about the background, the backstory of this piece that we're going to hear by Shostakovich. If you know his mature music, it's possible that the words that come to your mind when you think of his music are words like acerbic or ironic, and you think of it as being laced with subliminal, ambiguous musical messages which he inserted into musical bottles and cast adrift on the roiling Soviet seas of the 20th century. And all of that is true. You know, he was born in 1906, and so his life tracked along with the rise of Stalin and of the Soviet dictatorship. And over the course of his life, until he was 69 years old, he just rode this wild Soviet roller coaster. And it had a profound impact on the person that he became and the music that he wrote. But this piece dates from the beginning of all that. As I mentioned, he was 16 when he wrote it. And it has a kind of, there is proto Shostakovichian stuff in it. You, you will recognize it, I think, as Shostakovich. And yet there is also hard on the sleeve romanticism to this piece related to the circumstances under which he wrote it and the kind of a person he was when he was still a teenager. You may know he was a child prodigy and at the age of 13, he auditioned for Alexander Glazunov, who was the eminent composer and the head of the Petrograd Conservatory in the town where he grew up, which had started out as St. Petersburg before the revolution. And when Glazunov heard him play the piano at the age of 13 and heard him play his own music, he said, well, he has a level of talent akin to that of Mozart. And he said, you're in. Come study at the Petrograd Conservatory, even though you're barely a teenager. A couple of years later, the tragedy struck his family when his father, whose name was also Dmitry Boleslavovich Shostakovich, passed away suddenly of a heart attack. And this was a terrible moment, of course, emotionally and also financially for the family. His mother, Sofia Vasilyevna, was a trained pianist. She had studied at what was then the St. Petersburg Conservatory. And yet now she felt compelled to go to work as a typist and as a clerk, just to try to keep food on the table. These were bad times, and she wanted to keep her young son, Dmitri Mitya, as he was known, in the conservatory. And eventually, he realized that it wasn't enough money. And so when he was in the middle teens, he began to perform as a silent film piano accompanist in the Halekanad cinema of Petrograd. And his whole life he had been rather sickly, and now he was working days and he was working nights, and it took a toll on him, and eventually he came down with tuberculosis, and a rather bad case of it. And so he had to have lymph nodes removed from his neck. And Glazunov, the head of the conservatory, noted this, and he said it won't do if our prize student dies of tuberculosis. And so he engineered a grant to send him down to the Crimean Peninsula to a Black Sea sanitarium to recover. And recover he did, and it turned into a wonderful summer because while he was there, he met a young woman his own age named Tatiana Glevenko, and they fell madly in love with each other. And so it was a very halcyon summer in the end of it. And after that, they returned to their respective homes. She was from Moscow, he was from St. Petersburg. And of course, that was wrenching for both of them, and they tried to keep their relationship going by correspondence and by visiting occasionally, and eventually they couldn't, and they married other people with varying degrees of success. And after he died in 1975, she wrote a little summation of the relationship, which I thought I'd read to you. It was a love that endured throughout our lives. Here I believe that I am not only speaking for myself. I feel that it was a real pity that Mitya and I didn't marry. We had a wonderful love and we let it go. It may sound conceited, but I do think that Mitya would have been happier with me. <laughs> he didn't really have much happiness in his life. And so that fall of 1923, he returned to St. Petersburg, Petrograd, wrote this piece, dedicated it to Tanya. And he gave it a poetic subtitle. He called it Poem. And it does have a poetic and I think perhaps an even cinematic undercurrent in the way that it unfolds. And you'll hear it begins with these descending 
sighing, contemplative gestures which are passed from instrument to instrument, as if perhaps contemplating Tanya at a remove of hundreds of kilometers. And then it gains momentum and it becomes rather dissonant and it ends in this almost an ugly climax, the first section, and then we return to that sighing and all of that. And then it becomes more agitated and more, I think, proto-Shostakovichian, I think I said. And then there's a point at which you'll notice the cello steps out into the limelight all by himself. Everybody stops playing. And that serves as a kind of a preface into the middle section, which is really the heart of the piece. And this beautiful tender cello melody and this soaring violin melody and the music is rapturous and impressionist. And it really seems like the love scene or perhaps the love theme. And it goes on for quite a while. And then more sighing and more agitation. And if you know the way that his life turned out and if you know the way his music turned out, late in his life, his string quartets particularly end more often than not with this word morendo, which means in Italian, dying away. And they do tend to slouch off the musical stage in despair, but not this piece. This piece, he takes that love theme and he gives us a C major apotheosis marked triple forte expressivo molto. And if you buy into this notion that there is a cinematic undercurrent to this piece, that's the moment at which you may begin to see the credits rolling in your mind on this love story in musical terms. So I hope that will give you something to uh, think about while you listen to the piece. <laughs> 